stuff. Um, the interview today is going to be done by one of our students and one of our staff members, uh, Brad Rublo and Courtney Garcia, are going to be doing the interviewing. And uh, they're going to interview our forum guest today is Wilt Wallace, who is the Vice President of Urban and Rhythm Promotion at Warner Records in Atlanta. Um, he's been with the company for 13 years, uh, worked with countless artists. You may have noticed the photos or the playlist when you were coming in. These are all people he's worked with, um, including Wale, Meek Mill, Lil Scrappy, Lil Flip, Lil Boozy, lots of little people. Um, Gucci Mane, Party Next Door, Jason Derulio, Macklemore, Lil Pump, he was out of line. He should have been with the other Lil people. Um, and, and lots of others, the list is getting long. So, uh, Wilt's behind success of uh, Saweetie's hit, My Type, and Wale on Chill. Um, some like top 30 billboard stuff, and even number one on the rhythm and urban charts. Um, so he's gonna tell you about his background um, and the promotions, and then what we're gonna do after they talk for a little bit um, is he's gonna walk you through some of the promotion strategies and maybe get you involved with some ideas. So please welcome Courtney and Brad and Wilt. All right, so uh, this here is Will. Um, he's a friend of mine, and he came in just for this from Atlanta. So um, I'll let him start and kind of tell you a little bit about what his job is exactly. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Um, like they said, I'm the VP of Rhythm and Urban Promotion at Warner Records. One of the main duties of mine is getting our records played on the radio at the urban and rhythm formats throughout the country, which is a lot of the hip-hop and R&B stations, like Q93 here in New Orleans. And what is like a, a typical day for you? So kind of the duties you have, your tasks? It typically changes day to day, but uh, I oversee a field staff of eight to 10 people on the rhythmic side, as well as four people on the urban side. So making sure they have their goals and objectives for the week and you know, their targets, what areas we're targeting, making sure that all the stations I communicate with have the information, you know, what new stations have added our records, if there's a streaming story on a record, if it's been playlisted in Rap Caviar, whatever it is, if there's a tour coming up, making sure that the tour dates are covered and make sure that, you know, if we're gonna do promo around the tour, dates, making sure that people are, you know, set to be there and show up and uh, deliver with artists. Gotcha. So one thing I think was kind of funny is when he was, he said he'd come and do this, I asked to get his resume just so I could look through what he's done to kind of bring up with you guys, and he doesn't have a resume. So um, why don't you have a resume? Can you tell well, us? Well, I have not applied for a job in since 2004, so I just haven't had the need to make one. Um, Probably should have one, to be honest, but, you know, in the music business, a lot of times I feel like it's who you know, not necessarily what you know, and a lot of jobs are gotten through referrals. So if you kind of have the reputation and relationships, it's not really about what you put on the paper. I just want to know, because you, your first job was Enterprise before you went to Warner? Yeah, that was my first job out of college. Without a resume, how did you make that contact? Well, I, had a, I did have a resume when I was in college that I made that I used to get the job at Enterprise. Okay. And then while I was in college, I interned for an independent record label out of Atlanta called BME Recordings. That's where they talked about Little John, Little Scrappy, Trillville, Crime Mob, E-40. I worked with all those artists at that time. And so the relationship through BME Recordings is how I got connected with Warner because uh, BME had a distribution deal through Warner at the time. Gotcha. So did you, you were at Enterprise and you were kind of doing stuff on the side or how did this, how, how did well, you connect that? I was interning while I was already in college. So I started interning, a friend of mine, he, um, he became the head of marketing and promotion for BME Recordings. So he would take Lil John, Lil Scrappy, Trillville on the road and break their records throughout what we call the Chitlin Circuit, like around the Southeast and everything like that. And this is probably like 2002 maybe, 2003, something like that. So by building the relationship with him, um, I'm sorry, what was I? Well, if you're working at Enterprise, like where did oh, you get that, that job? Oh, that's right, the Enterprise part. So, that, so working with him, I was still in college. When I finished college, I tried to get a job with them and they didn't have anything available. So I had to pay bills. So that's why I went and got the job with Enterprise. That was really just to pay rent until I could find a job in the industry because I knew what I wanted to do. Like, got there's it. no other options. Okay, so, and then you, you quit Enterprise to take a job at Warner. I but did. You, you, so 
when I applied for the job at Enterprise, um, a, a friend of mine, when I was, I was, I graduated college, I'd been out of college probably about, I don't know, three to six months, and a friend of mine was working for Enterprise. I didn't know that at the time, but he would come and have me work his records for him. Like at the time, we still used to press up vinyl records and CDs and take them to the club and get the DJs to play them and stuff like that. So he would bring his artist product to me because he knew I had the relationships with the DJs through Lil Jon and that crew. So he would bring his records to me and pay me to work his records. And I'm like, well, how are you getting money to pay me? You know, you always got a suit and a tie on. You're going somewhere. Like, what are you doing? And he was like, yeah, I work at Enterprise, rent a car. And they have a program, a referral program where you can get hired. If you get hired, I, he would get a bonus of $1,500. So he was like, if you go through the three interview process and I get the bonus, I'll split it with you $750, $750. So I'm like, that's rent right there. Like, you know, just go through these interviews. I don't have to take the job. You know, I just get rent. So, you know, again, hustling, just trying to make it. And um, in the second interview, the guy at Enterprise was like, yeah, so, you know, we have branches all around the country. So, you know, we don't encourage it, but after six months, you can transfer. And that just set off a light in my head because I knew that there were more opportunities in New York and LA to get inside a major record company at the time than there were in Atlanta. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna get the job at Enterprise, save up my money for six months and move to LA. So that's what I did. I transferred with Enterprise into LA. And after about six months of living in LA, working at Enterprise, I'm trying to get in the industry, but the doors are all closed. I'm just bang, banging my head, banging my head. And an opportunity presented itself. Uh, a friend of mine, the guy, same guy from BME, who was uh, the head of marketing and promotions, he reached out to me and was like, are you ready to get back in the music business? And I was like, yeah, like <laughs> my shoes are soaked, I'm washing cars, like, yeah, I need to get into business. And so he said that a guy had taken over the, um, the promotion department at Warner and he needed some help. So basically he put us together and I had to chase the guy for like two months. I'm sending him emails, I'm following up, I'm calling him, I'm texting him. He's not getting back to me. So finally he kind of, he catches him one night when he's in Atlanta, puts me on three way with him and is like, just be quiet. I'm gonna get him comfortable. Then after he's comfortable, I'm gonna let him know you're on the phone. So he gets him comfortable. The guy starts laughing, telling stories. And then uh, he's like, oh yeah, I got my man Wood on the phone. And I just heard his heart drop. He's like, oh. You know, because he knows he's been ducking me. So he invited me in for a meeting. And in the meeting, he was like, you know, if you really want to work here, pretty much, you know, you're going to have to prove it to me. So he's like, what I can offer you is the potential to maybe make $800 a month. I'm, I'm making 40000 a year at Enterprise. He's like, you can maybe make $800 a month if you come in for a couple of weeks and prove that you're worthy of that $800 a month. So... I walked out of that meeting and it was you know, a big decision to make at that time. It's like, you know, I'm making enough money to be comfortable, but I'm not doing what I want to do. So I walked out of that meeting and I called Enterprise and I said, I'm never coming back. And a month later, I got hired as a temp. Another couple months later, I got hired as an assistant. And 13 years later, I'm the vice president of the company. <laughs> and he, he actually worked for quite a while for pretty much nothing. Any, I, any guess how, how long he worked for free? How long? Yes. Anybody. Speak up. Two? Four years? Three. 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 And, Three and years. just to clarify, that wasn't with Warner, that was with BME. That was like, that's the time while I was in college and after college when I was trying to get a job with them. And that was interning or that was more like interning in different departments, picking up different like shifts or like gigs through well, certain... BME was a small company. It was four partners that started the company. It was this guy that was on the radio in Atlanta named Emperor Cersei. It's Lil John. It was Lil John's manager, Rob McDowell, and it's their uh, business attorney uh, or music business attorney, Vince Phillips. And the four of these guys started this company. So it was a very small company. It's only about like eight to ten people in the office, you know. So it really started off just coming to the office and just sitting around and hanging out, listening to music, and just being a fly on the wall trying to learn what they were doing. And then that became hey, you, you're in college, right? I was like, yeah, well, go pass out these CDs. Okay, well, go put up these flyers. You know, go po pass out these flyers. Go put up these posters. You know any DJs? Go to the club tonight. Make a friend with a DJ. Get the record played. And so it wasn't like an official, like, internship. Like, you know, like, it, on the books, it was more just hanging around and making myself useful and proving to them that I belonged and that I could handle the pressure. Because um, 
it wasn't easy to get records played in Atlanta, like going into the strip clubs and breaking rap records by artists that nobody's ever heard of. The DJ's looking at you like, Lil Who, what? You know, like John was big, but Scrappy and Trillville, they were just getting started. Like their stuff was just popping at high school parties and stuff in Atlanta. So it was just, a, it was just a grind. And so I just, you know, again, like I just hung in there and I would come to the, anytime I didn't have class, I'd go to the office at 10 a.m. I'd answer phones, I'd send faxes. Yes, I'm that old, we sent faxes in those days. Um, I would, you know, put together packages for DJs and then, you know, it was like a fake it to make it thing. Like I would call radio DJs and tell them that, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an intern. I was like, I work here. I'm the head of marketing, like play my record. You know what I mean? So it was like, it's just like, you know, it's like a really fake it to make it type of situation is what I did there. Even when I first started at Warner and I was a temp, I went to FedEx Kinko's and pressed on my own business cards because I didn't want anybody to know I was an assistant. I wanted to be like respected and people would like judge you for your title. So I pressed up my own business cards and started going out and networking and stuff like that. What did you say to the DJ at the strip club to get them to play your um, You know, you just gotta position it right. It's all psychology. It's just like figuring out like, what is their goals and objectives? What are they trying to do? They're trying to get the girls to move. So maybe you go tip the girl and like, yo, ask them to play those record, you know what I mean? Or maybe you, you know, buy them a drink and start talking sports with him and get kind of chummy with him. And then it's like, he's like, oh, so what do you do? Well, by the way, I got this record, you know? It just depends, you know? But like, the main thing that I learned is you don't go peak of the night on the hottest night at 1.30 in the morning. Like, he's there like trying to keep his crowd hot, this packed wall, a wall, this sweat on the walls. And you're like, hey, can you play my record? Like, no, get out my face. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> right. how did he get in the booth? You know, so like, that, so it's like, uh, you go during the day shift, you go when he's warming up, like you go for the opening DJ who's there at like 9 p.m. and he's just setting up equipment and you start building a relationship with him. And then eventually, next thing you know, a few years later, you know, he's the man and it's like, he respects you because you messed with him when he was nobody. So that's what it's really about for me is like the psychology of just seeing where people are at, what they need and how I can kind of connect with that. So one time um, I, I used to write and I was trying to get an in interview with Kendrick Lamar and he was just really hard to nail down. So I was going around all these festivals where he was going to be to finally get this interview and I ran into uh, to Wilt at one of these and was complaining about this. And what you told me was that a lot of these artists that were, they are hip hop and they kind of grew up putting on a mixtape on the streets so they don't believe in press and, and doing that kind of thing because they didn't have to do it in the first place. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, do you, how do the, how do you kind of get the artists to do what you want when you're setting up these promotions and strategies? Yeah, again, that, that's, it's all psychology. It's like getting people to do what you want them to do on your time, on your timetable, but making them feel like it's their idea. Like, you know, it's, it's just like, it's the same stuff I do with my daughter to get her to eat, eat dinner. It's like, it's like, you just got to kind of get in their head and kind of, it's, you know, honestly, it's a little manipulation that goes into it, but, um, you know, case by case, it just depends on who you're working with. But at that time, like Kendrick and them, like it, during the mixtape era, you know, it's not really mixtapes aren't really what it was during that era. Um, a lot of guys did pop off their mixtapes and then go on tour and they're making money and they're doing shows. And it's like, why do I need radio? Why do I need press? And what you make them realize is like, do you want to go from that 500 seat club to the 5000 seat venue to the 10,000 seat venue? then you might want to be on the radio. You might want to be written up in the blogs. You might want to be on television. Like, so you have to, and you know, you have to see what are their goals and objectives. Some people are like, nah, I'm cool with the 500 seat room and that's where I'm going to be, you know? So you kind of have to just figure out what do they want to do? And if they want bigger and more then you show them the pathway, you know? And so we deal with it now, like it's not the mixtapes anymore, but a lot of kids blow up on SoundCloud or something like that, you know? And they're like, yo, I got, you know, a million followers on Instagram. Why do I need the radio station? You know, nobody listens to radio. That's what they say. But radio is still the the fastest, largest way to reach the widest audience at one time, like with your music. Like there's a built-in audience, whether it's playing in businesses, whether it's playing in, you know, rental cars, whatever it is, people are tuned into the radio. So, you know, it's still the way to reach the masses, kind of the passive by audience, you know. Just to piggyback off that a little bit, I know... You said, like, working with Meek Mill and his earlier projects, like, to where he's at now, owning Dream Chasers as a label. Like, how was that experience working with Dreams and Nightmares? Like, I saw some of your credits yeah. on the pictures as it was rolling. 
Yeah, it was awesome because Meek just had this infectious, incredible energy. You know, he was just so passionate about his music and his team, and he was relentless, and he was hardworking, and he was somebody that came from that mixtape era, you know, and his Mm -hmm. mixtapes were crazy, and he had this following that was so um, loyal to him. So it was really crazy, I mean, like, to, to see a song like the song Dreams and Nightmares, and like, we knew we couldn't really work it at radio. It wasn't really a radio song, but to go into a club and see, like, you know, 5,000 people, hold on, wait a minute, mm-hmm, you didn't think yeah. I'm finished? You know, it's like, it just, like, Meek was just, it was incredible. Unfortunately, he moved over to Atlantic Records, and so after that first project, that first album, I didn't work with him anymore. So I wasn't there through, you know, where he went to championships and all that. Gotcha. Like, I didn't get it to that point, but. Did you work with him when he was going through his whole um, incarceration issue? I didn't, but I have worked with other artists that have, like Gucci Man. You know, he went through a lot of different legal battles while we were working with him. Um, I feel like there's some, oh, Lil Bootsy went through a lot of legal issues. And it's unfortunate because it's like a double edged sword. Like, on one side, sometimes the legal battles can give you free publicity on some level or kind of give you some type of cred or some type of, not that they do it for that, but that does happen. But on the other side, you're also missing up on, uh, missing out on opportunities. You know what I mean? Like, you're not, like, now you're, as hot as you've ever been and you're in jail, you can't go tour and that's where a lot of artists exactly. make their money and stuff. So you can't get out there and move around and touch the people and campaign and in the marketplace now, um, music moves so fast, you know, six months and they're on to the next artist and they don't even remember you anymore. So like you kind of have to be engaged. So it was really um, dope that Meek was able to go through that and come back and still be at his peak. Cause a lot of guys go in and when they come out, they're like, it, it takes a lot of work to get back, you know? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, so what we want to do um, is kind of go through a few different campaigns he worked on. Um, anyone know Sweetie? Yeah. That's my type. Yeah, that okay. should go. I heard him. <laughs> <laughs> so we are we were gonna play like a little clip, but we couldn't really find a nice I, I know. little verse of it. So we you should have hit me. I got the super clean. I get it played on the radio. <laughs> um, That's true. That's true. So she was kind of a no name, right? when this came around? Not this song. Um, So we signed her in early 2018, and um, she had a song called Icy Girl. And y'all remember that? You know, can't stop, won't stop. So she was doing what they call car raps. Like she would sit in the car and rap on camera and post it on Instagram or YouTube or stuff like that. And she built up a really strong following. Like, so to the masses, yes, she was new, but you know, her video on YouTube had 10 million views when we signed her. her. Uh, she had over 10 million streams on Spotify. So she had a, a, a fan base out there that was rocking with her. And so over that process from January, February 18 to when we get to my type in March of 19, like it was a real artist development process. I remember her first promo run actually was through New Orleans. She came there, used to be a station power, uh, one, power 102, I think, here. And um, I think it flipped to like Urban AC. Now they play R&B, but they used to play hip hop. And so she did an event for them, I think during Mardi Gras last year. And um, I remember that. You remember, remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So she did that and went to Lafayette and she was like going to these small all little markets and doing all the work you know I put her in a SUV and we ran through like Macon Georgia Savannah Georgia Jacksonville Gainesville and she really did all the work and went out there and connected with the DJs and built with the different people uh, the program directors the radio stations the local mom and top pop stores whatever she could she was out there campaigning so a lot of people look at it like okay my type came out and it blew up and now she's here but there was you know 12 months with us leading up to that, and then another probably 12 months before she got signed leading up to getting signed. So it's a process of the development. It's not just the one song, you know, it's the whole process. So what do you do exactly? Like, do you sit down with a team? Like, okay, she's got this single coming out. Let's plan, like, how do you kind of plan this out? Yeah, so the a r department will sign the artists and make the records, right? So they create the music. Every artist has their own process. You know, some artists, they have their own producers and they get the music. Some, the A&Rs, produ- uh, per, you know, present the music or the producers and put it together. You know, so it just depends on the artist. But whatever that is, they go through the process. They get the music finalized. The company decides, yeah, we believe in this music. We want to promote this music. Then it goes to the marketing department and they come up with the strategies. They'll come to us, the promotion department. How are we going to push it out, they'll go to the publicity department, how are we gonna get her placed in the right press outlets and things like that. And marketing is kind of the hub for all of that. So I would say almost like A&R, like they cook the meal and then marketing kind of plates the meal and then we serve it, you know what I mean, so. 
Now, I have a question about the sample part being that you are head of promotion. Is it any like restrictions or does it help that my type is a well-known sample from back in the day? It it helped. It definitely helped, I think, on this song, but it can be hit or miss because if you flip a sample and you don't flip it right and people don't appreciate it, it could it could break. You know what I mean? Right. Like it come back the other side way. Oh, how you gonna redo it? Like I know like this isn't one of my artists, but like with Beyonce doing the Before I Let Go song, like a lot of people that are like my brother's age and older than me are like, how's she gonna flip a classic like that? Like, you know, like you're killing my song, you know, so you have that part of it too that can come into effect. So it's a risk, you know, but with radio with uh with music with a lot of different uh like the clubs it's all about familiarity so having that familiarity like that familiar melody that familiar sound that familiar sample sometimes helps i mean like with the three songs that we worked this summer from my tape to on show to the wife and lucci all night long they were all flips of old records yes yep you know what do you think was the most successful thing you did that made her so like kind of blow up with sweetie i feel like <laughs> I mean, we just believed in her, you know what I mean? It's just believed in her and we stuck with her. I mean, you know, the Up Now song didn't maybe go as far as we wanted it to. Um, you know, she had, you know, she put out the EP that my type was on and there was a different song that we thought was gonna be the record to take out, take off. And the EP came out and the people decided, they were like, we looked at the streams, we looked at the analytics, the data, and it said, my type is the song that people wanna hear, you know? So I think that just sticking with your artists and believing in them and continuing to present them with opportunities um, through good times and bad times is, you know, how we do our job the best. You know, that's what we add to the table. And the piggyback on Wale on show, aren't we supposed to do like a, yeah. Just before a moment, any, any challenges with Sweetie along the way? Oh. Um, there were some people like sometimes on the internet, you know, sometimes like you read through the comments and things that people said, you know what I'm saying about her along the way, they, they were a little challenging, but she overcame it. She's really strong. She's really smart. She's educated. She has a college degree. Like she, um, is a businesswoman, and um, but she she's had to overcome a lot because there were a lot of people in the beginning that didn't believe, you know. So that was a little bit of a challenge. Like you know, she wasn't doing the freestyles like Megan the Stallion and some of them. So you know, you get artists compared to each other. But I feel like it's unfair because every artist has their own sound on their own lane, and you got to kind of let them be them, you know. So there was some some challenges in that sense, and um, you know with my type, it didn't just take off right away. It kind of was a slow build. And then once we got to the summer, it exploded. Then when the video dropped, I feel like that's what really drove it home. Like her sitting on that basketball hoop at the court, like it just, everybody went crazy. Like, so I really feel like we set the record up in the spring, 4th of July, it exploded. By the time we got to Labor Day, it was like, it was a smash. You know, you go on arenas on the Chris Brown tour and like the whole arena singing the song when they play it, you know. Okay, yes, yeah, so we have an, the, another song he worked on was Wale on Chill, and we have a little clip of a video to show you. How many people have heard this song? Just curious. Okay, great. Hands up. <laughs> so, Will's been working with Wale for a really long time, um, and one thing that's interesting to me about this is, you know, he hadn't put anything out for a while, so we were, you know, wanted to hear a little bit about how you addressed him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I worked with Wale early on, um, not when he first started, he was on Interscope Records, he put out an album and had a song with Lady Gaga, and then he left Interscope and came to Warner, and that's when he put out the Ambition album. And um, I'm sure some of you guys heard that album, had Lotus Flower Bomb on it, which was nominated for a Grammy. So um, it's real personal with Wale. I remember being in the studio in Atlanta, because he was living in Atlanta when he was recording that album, as well as the 11111 Theory mixtape that preceded that album and being in the studio with him and watching him work tirelessly to make a perfect project and the project came out amazing so over time eventually the urban department from Warner shifted to Atlantic and so because Atlantic Records and Warner Records are both owned by Warner Music Group so we're under the same parent company but we operate as competitors and so they moved the whole urban department. So everybody we were working with from Wale to um, Kirk Bangs to Meek Mill to Gucci Mane, they all moved over to Atlantic Records. So for that first project at Atlantic, the Gifted Project, I worked with him on the song Bad with uh, Tierra Thomas that uh, Rihanna in in eventually, eventually jumped on. And then I went back to Warner to help head up the new urban phase of Warner. So then I wasn't in his career for the next, I don't know, six years or whatever. And then he left Atlantic last year, last May. And it was interesting because 
they announced him signing back to Warner the day before they announced my promotion to be a vice president. So our careers kind of directly aligned at that moment. And he had a song called Black Bonnie with uh, Jacquees. You guys, a few people heard that? So again, like talking about the Sweetie process, like to get to On Chill, we had to start with Black Bonnie, you know, and then he had to put out the Free Lunch EP that had the record My Boy with J. Cole and, you know, a bunch of other dope records on there, the record with Eric Bellinger, he has some great music on there. And then you get to Top of the Year and we have Pole Dancer with Megan Thee Stallion before people really knew who Megan Thee Stallion was. And Wale has a gift for that, like he picked Miguel before people really knew Miguel. He picked Tierra Thomas before people knew Tierra, and he did the same thing with Meg. And he he has a real gift for that. And so um, we, you know, we worked Pole Dancer and built that up. So Black Bonnie went top 30 at radio and then Pole Dancer went top 20 at radio. So now the table was set for on chill. You know, it's like he was back in the conversation. So it was like a process of building up to that. Do you think him kind of collaborating with all these people is part of, would you say that's part of your promotion or is that just what he was wanting to That do? would be more a part of just his method to create, creating music and what he wants to do. How did you decide you wanted to do on Chill? It was a process. It was a, it was a collective. You know, we all kind of huddled up just to decide what the next song should be. He had a lot of great music. The album that's out now, uh, Wow, That's Crazy, a lot of the music was finished. Um, so... We had a lot of different options, but from a radio standpoint, from my world perspective, Orange Chill was just the natural fit. Like, it just sounded like a radio record. And then, you know, with the classic Raphael Sadiq sample in there, like, you know, a lot of people can, you know, have that nostalgia to that type of record. So it just made sense. And we just came together as a team, you know, and we all huddled and we all agreed that that was the single. And, you know, it was a little nerve wracking because you, you know, so many times in my career, like, I've been all in on a record, like, yo, this is a hit, we're gonna pull it out, it's gonna blow up, and it just, you know what I'm saying? Then sometimes I'm like, that record's trash, and then it's like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you never really know how the consumers are gonna react. So with On Chill, I believe that like, this is a hit. You know, I, I in my mind, I'm like, this is a top 10 record. You know, I wasn't like, oh, it's definitely gonna be number one, but I was like, it's a top 10 record, it feels strong. And then we put it out, and like immediately, the like people just hitting him, hitting me. Like I remember sending it out, and like that night, like two in the morning, I'm getting emails from DJs like, "Yo, send me that new Wale. I need that. I need no new Wale and Jeremiah now." So, and you know, it's like it's just a it's a process. But every every record is different. You know, some the A and R department decides, some the artist decides. He's like, "Yo, this is the single. I don't care what you guys think." Some the CEO of the company decides. Some the promotion department. It just kind of depends, but. That one was more of like a collective decision. And how do you know what markets, even though you hit every region, because I'm pretty sure every radio station has a song, but how do you know which ones, like maybe an analysis of like who's going to play it more to who's going to frequently play it at certain times of the day? It's like, how question. do you. It's a real good question. Um, usually I go by the sound of the record, you know, also where the artist is from. You know, like Wale's from DC, but DC is also a, some DMV in here. Shout out to the DMV. I'm born and raised DMV. But um, so Wale being from the DMV and then also DC being a heavy R&B market. Like when I was growing up in DC, like there really wasn't a rap culture. It was like you had Go-Go was the street music and R&B was like the mainstream music. And that was it. So with that being said, and this being an R&B leaning record, you know, DC was going to be key. And also him being from there, you know, DC was key. Um, Atlanta, you know, I sat with some of the program directors in Atlanta before we put the record out, like, hey, check this out, Wale's back with the type, because while we're working pro pole dancers, some of the programmers are like, yo, this is cool, but I need that R&B, I need that that bad, that uh, Lotus Flower Bomb, when Wale gonna give me another one of those? So I was like, he got one, just just chill, let me get pole dancer up, just chill, we're coming. So when it was time, I went to them before we put it out, I'm like, look, this is the record I've been telling you about, let me know, and they like, first 15 seconds of the song, like, oh yeah, that's a smash. So, you know, when you have a market like Atlanta that's a trend-setting market, getting them in early on a record helps influence other markets, because other markets look at Atlanta, you know? But somebody like Sweetie, she's from the West Coast, so it's important that we get LA and Sacramento first, you know what I mean? So it just kind of depends on the artist, the record, what the record sounds like, you know, if it was something that had like, like that Drake record that had the New Orleans bounce type of vibe in it, I would imagine that New Orleans is a big part of their plan, you know, so kind of just case by case basis. Gotcha. Cool, and then we have one more little clip to show you, Macklemore um, Thrift Shop.
Um, I, well, I picked this video because it has over a billion views on YouTube, which is crazy. Um, anybody like Macklemore? A little bit of a different, huh? <laughs> I also thought it'd be kind of a different artist to look at. Um, so we wanted to know just really, um, with someone that's like an international success, how do you manage that? And how do you keep it interesting after you've done so much? Um, we're not currently working with Macklemore at this stage. At least we haven't done anything with him recently. He was, he was a unique case where he wasn't signed to the label. He had a distribution situation. And we are, offer like artist services, so part of the services we offered was we partnered up with them to do the radio promotion for his campaign for Thrift Shop and Can't Hold Us and um, Same Love and you know the songs from that project. So I don't know that he was like as big internationally at the time when we were working Thrift Shop. You know, I, I, from, from my recollection, because this is years ago, but from my recollection, Radio in the States really didn't know who he was. You know, he had built up a touring base of getting in a van and going up and down the West Coast and just doing, him and Ryan Lewis just doing shows and just building up a real organic fan base. So they had this huge fan base, but they hadn't been on the radio yet, you know? And then when we took Thrift Shop to radio and then Can't Hold Us, it's funny, like at the Saints game yesterday, they played Can't Hold Us and I'm like, wow, this record's still like a big, massive record. So it's like that, I feel like, kind of exploded internationally and then the whole thing with the Grand Grammys and same love and all that, you know, kind of took it to the next level. But then coming back and working with him after that, we did work a few more songs with him. And, you know, him specifically, I can't speak for every international superstar. He's the nicest, most humble, down to earth, intelligent, hardworking artist that you can imagine. So it really wasn't a challenge. Like he really made everything easy. Like, you know, he, he was touring and doing arenas and selling out shows and he made sure all of our radio people could get into the show to see the feeling, see the vibe, see that the audience in their home market is reacting to these songs. You know, he would do meet and greets after the show, take pictures with every fan. Like, you know, he's, he was really just a great guy to work with. It was a fun process. I know for our intro to music industry course, Macklemore is like a case study for us because how he freelanced his marketing mm -hmm. and promotion. Mm -hmm. Can you go into a little bit detail about it? Because we hear from our teachers, but it's another thing to kind of maybe get like a scenario or synopsis from you. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of that, I would say, probably falls in the business affairs department. So as far as how those deals are structured, you know what I mean? Like the, this all like lawyer stuff that's way above my head. But um I just know it was different. Like, I know that it was like he wasn't our artist, but we were partnered with him and working with him on his music. And he was a great partner to work with, but it wasn't like somebody that was signed directly. Like, I don't think we own the masters or any of that type of stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So it's hard for me to really give too much insight onto how that was structured. It was more like, I'm on a conference call one day at the time, and they're like, all right, we're gonna be working with this guy named Macklemore. And at the time I hadn't heard of him, you know? And so, gotcha. and it was like, going out there and just pounding the pavement with thrift shop and then once that broke through like it was it was a thing of its own it became its own monster you know gotcha so being that he pretty much like looked at it as a work for hire was it a budget that was given to you and said okay this is my single promoted to this particular region or this particular state city we definitely uh, I can't tell you like budget wise how that how that process worked out either because I, I really don't know like at that time I wasn't a vice president so I wasn't in some of those conversations you know um, gotcha. but with working with him we did like target certain regions definitely the Pacific Northwest you know he's from Seattle so definitely making sure that Seattle Portland San Francisco you know and um, you know it was the rhythmic radio format along with the top 40 radio format and rhythmic is kind of like the lane the way I look at it you know is kind of the lane between urban and top 40. So you might have some rhythmic stations that lean more top 40 and play, you know, Katy Perry or something like that. But then you have some rhythmic stations depending on the population of that area, because radio is still like one of the only localized mediums, you know. Um, where in the southeast, like a place like Birmingham, it might the rhythmic station might lean more urban and play like you know rap music all day. So. Cool. Do you get more excited when you're going to these DJs with a new artist that no one's heard of or with it like a really hot artist that everyone knows in a new song? That part doesn't really change my level of excitement. My level of excitement is based off of the sound of the record. Like if the record just sounds great and I see where it fits and I'm like, yeah, like we had this kid, Kirk O'Bangs, that had this song, Drank In My Cup, and... Uh -huh. it, 
Yeah, that was and, my song too, no lie. <laughs> and a, a, a lot of people had never heard of Kirko outside of Houston. Like Houston was on him heavy on his song, What Your Name Is, before drinking my cup. And I remember like a buddy of mine that worked at the label was calling me like, yo, you need to get on this Kirko, you need to start working. And I'm like, well, the label hasn't really made it a priority yet. I'm kind of focused on some other things at the time that were priorities. And so Kirko was doing this big car show for the radio station in Houston. And like in the South, they do these things like car show, like the dub car shows with the rim. So he's doing this car show for the radio station. And I go there, and again, this is a kid that nobody outside of Houston has ever heard of. He only has this song, What Your Name Is. It's like a glorified freestyle. And he performs, and the whole building erupts. And then after that, we had him set to go sign autographs at a booth. And I'm like, nobody's going to want an autograph. I mean, people were, like, pushing the booth over. Girls were having him sign their chest. Like, I was like... I'm taking this back to Atlanta. So like that was exciting, like to see the energy that was only in Houston and be able to want to be the one to like first take that energy outside of Houston and take it somewhere else and then see it connect. Like that was exciting for me. So I remember like taking Kirko in a in a SUV and just running him around Atlanta, like three clubs a night, like just going in every club and he's performing, whether it's 15 people or 1500 people, he's performing his record and that's during what your name is. And that song kind of took off, but the label never fully got behind it. And then when Drinking My Cup came, the label kind of got a little bit behind it, but it kind of stalled for a minute. And it was kind of just sitting. And it, it was like seven months we worked that campaign. And then at the end of it, you know, it went number one at Rhythmic, and it went number one for eight weeks, which is a long time to be number one. Like, records don't park that long for two months. So I just remember how rewarding it was to think about this kid in Houston that nobody had ever heard of and how we, like, really grinded it out. So for me, those are, like, the rewarding moments. And so I guess... To your point, maybe because he was unknown, it, that's why it worked out that way. But even with like somebody like Wale, where he hadn't had a hit in a few years, and people were like, you know, maybe not expecting him to have another number one record, and to be able to like take on Chill and see it where it is now, like that's exciting for me. I got one more question, and then maybe see if you guys have any questions. But um, is there anything you learned or picked up working at Enterprise that you kind of still? have or use in, in your yeah that whole psychology part I was talking about like you know like dealing with angry customers you know people that just got there because inter enterprises is big like not in the recreational rentals they're big in like the replacement rentals so when you get your car in a body shop or your car is at the dealership getting worked on so a lot of times those customers are upset so dealing with the psychological part of trying to you know customer service and work the whole psychological game with them and also just the work ethic like because I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for like work ethic. Like my thing is just outworking everybody. I want to piggyback off the psychology uh, perspective because we have to take that as one of our core electives here. For the students, that's like my boy DJ X. Like for the ones who are coming and building their fan base at colleges, like Megan Thee Stallion blew off from TSU. Like even though nobody doesn't know them, but they still have a at reach fan base that they can touch at the universities, what would be some good promotional tips and marketing adv advice for them, like throwing their shows for the ones who came up here and did their announcements? Like, what's some real good promo I mean, the, the guy that came up here and said 200 free people get in, like, to the party, like, to me, that's a good, you know, tactic right there. Like, you know, you're serving your base, and I feel like getting your warm market, the people who already know you, the people that are closest to you, excited about what you're doing. And a lot of times, we can neglect our warm market because we want the people that don't know us to pay attention to us. So it's like, okay, yeah, I'm popping in my little area, but they already been on me. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried, but I think that you got to really super serve them and then they become like your messengers to go spread the gospel or whatever you got. You know what I mean? And it's about having people around you, like a team of people that are dedicated, that believe in you, that have work ethic. You know, I talk to people all the time and with artists that are like, you know, I need a manager that knows the music industry. You know, how do I, you know, how do I get that? And I'm like, a lot of times if you're just starting, a manager that knows the music industry is not going to give you the time of day. But so they're like, but, you know, the homeboy manager, I hear that's a bad thing. And I'm like, it can be if you pick the wrong homeboy, if you just pick him because he's your homeboy. But you need to pick the person with the work ethic. Like, look at the way he keeps his car. Look at the way, does he go to work on time every day? Does he pay his bills? How's his credit? You know what I'm saying? Does he deal with his relationships? Facts. I'm serious. Like, all <laughs> that stuff matters because at the the end of the day when you want him handling your money for your shows that you're getting booked for how he manages money how he handles relationships you know we we deal with club promoters sometimes that are a little shady and they might not try to pay you so you know is he comfortable having the uncomfortable conversation you know like so really think about this person is like 
you have a company and you're hiring them for a job like does this person carry the the mission and the 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 you know the the what you have like the theme of your of your movement you know do they fit do they know how to tell your story too cuz like if you're a trap rapper and they don't listen to trap music, they might not know how to tell that story. You know, like, can they go and tell your story as good, if not better than you? And that's one thing that Kirko had. Like, he had a uh, manager that didn't know anything about the music business, but he was passionate, he was organized, he was focused, and, you know, that's that's it. Like, work ethic and, you know, being organized and things like that, so. Cool. Uh, does anybody have questions? Ah, there we go. Um, as an artist, your fan base is your value. So connecting with your audience, you know what I mean? Like, cause you know, I don't spend a lot of time in New Orleans, so there might be an audience that I don't even know exists. There might be some type of movement. Like when I was working with Scrappy and them, like the crunk movement, like I was like, what is crunk music? I'm from Virginia, like I don't, what is crunk? You know what I'm saying? I listen to Nas and Biggie, like what is crunk? And I, I would go to a high school party and see 1500 kids, you know, doing that, like hitting their hands with their fists. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what crunk is. It's a movement. So like, again, that his audience was his, you know, was his value, you know? And I think that that's key. Like, even if you're not an artist, if you're a DJ, whatever, like your fan base, the people that you can move, like those are your numbers. And that's gonna be like the lifeline of your career. That's why I always saw artists, cause a lot of artists like, what kind of music I gotta make for the label to want me? And I'm like, stop worrying about what the label wants. Like, what do the fans want? Like, cause the label at the end of the day, they're gonna chase whatever the fans want. You know, then, you know, it's, it's not about the, like from Party Next Door, the Little Pump, like totally different type of music. But if they have the right audience and the right type of sound where we believe it's something that can work, like we're gonna invest in it, you know? It could be a million different factors. I've seen artists get signed with 4,000 Instagram followers and the label just believed in the sound of their music. But I've also seen artists where I know the executives did not understand the music. There's no way they understood it, but they saw this massive following or analytics or data or whatever, and it becomes this big bidding war. And it's like, you know, they get in and, and spend the big money. So, I mean, there's no like norm. Like that's the one thing. And like what I was telling you earlier, like it's like, it's like uh, this, you know, when you're like a doctor or something, like there's a set career path, right? You go to college and then you go to med school, then you do your internship, residency, blah, blah. Like there's a career path and books and everything that somebody can say, if you follow these steps and do it well, you're gonna be a doctor and you'll be fine. That that doesn't exist in artistic entertainment. Like it does, like there's no path. Like I can name 10 artists and they all have a different path. I can name five labels and they all have different ways they make their decisions, you know? so. You can't really get caught up in that. You just gotta believe in the type of art that you're putting out and connect with the people who respond to it. I mean, it depends. Like, so if you're a person that like has social anxiety, then maybe doing radio interviews is tough for you, right? Or if you're a person that doesn't like the way you look, maybe shooting videos is tough for you, you know what I mean? Or if you're a person that doesn't really have strong work ethic and you like to sleep all day, then maybe getting up to go to the morning show is hard for you, you know what I mean? Or you know, if you're a person that has substance abuse issues and you need to kind of chill out on that so you can be focused, maybe that's hard for you. You know, sometimes it's like, the energy of where you were making your music in your homeboy's basement just gave you that vibe where you guys connected and now they're putting you in these big expensive studios and it feels plastic and fake and you're not comfortable and maybe that's hard, you know what I'm saying? So it, again, it's like, it depends based on the artist and you know what their personal setbacks are. Tell an artist that their song is not working. Can you give an example maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, I'm just saying like, Sometimes you can do everything in your power and the song just does not connect for whatever reason. Like, and that's like their baby, you know what I'm saying? They know that they see me out there working 10 other songs. So they're thinking like, nah, you just didn't give my baby the right attention. You know, you like, what's up, you know? So it's always everything's wrong except for the song, right? Like, it's like, nah, I can't be my song. My song is dope, it's everything else. It's the way you market it is, the way you shot the video. It's the way you did this. You didn't spend enough money, whatever. So. I would say the hardest thing for me is coming and telling somebody that's truly passionate about their music, somebody that I believe in, somebody that maybe I built a friendship with, you know, we're on the road together for hours, sitting in cars and nightclubs and, you know, our lives have been on the line together, you know what I mean? And like to tell them like, hey, they don't want your song, like that's, that's hard. Cause like you're crushing somebody's dream, you know? It's like, that, that's probably the toughest part of um, my job. We use it, yeah, it's made as art and we use it, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there might be certain campaigns where like you might 
use it as part of is a promotional tool like the way it's shot may play into the campaign that we're presenting but usually it's shot as art and then we just use it as a tool if I knew that, I would be successful for every artist I push. I mean, it's hard. I mean, you know, there's different data and analytics you can watch. You know, you can kind of do comparable artists and you can see, you know, like what's worked in other markets or, you know, there's different things that we look at. You know, we look at the streams, we look at a lot of charts and data and stuff like that. But still, there's, you really don't know because, I mean, it's emo music's an emotional thing. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a vibration. It's a sound vibration. So I feel like as labels, sometimes we over intellectualize it and make it too scientific and sometimes it's just a vibe you know what i mean sometimes it's not about graphs and charts it's like you guys it's the real people that like hear something and you were going through a hard day and they say a lyric that just hit right there and like now it's your favorite song and you tell everybody else and you know so it, it's it's really hard i mean we have different data and analytics that we use but it's kind of hard like a lot of people didn't know Cardi B was going to be as big as Cardi B is, you know what I mean? So like, it's, it's, it's hard to call it, you know? And then there's other artists who, you know, like somebody like to, you know, like somebody like a Dave East or somebody like that is like, like, you know, a great rapper, but maybe hasn't reached that next level of success yet. And people thought like, oh, he's next, he's the next Nas, he's, you know, he, and, you know, so it's hard to predict it or Jay Electronica or somebody like that that's amazing and it just hasn't, you know, matriculated, so. It's just like read and react. It's like, um, like I won't say the specific, but there was an artist where we put out a song, we put a whole lot of money behind it because we believed that was the song. And we got out there and the data said, that's not the song. And there was another song that was the song. So we quickly just switched everything and moved to the other song, you know? Um, sometimes it's not that easy because sometimes the manager might not agree with you and they're like, nah, you didn't give the first song enough chance. And we're like, no, like, it's the other song, we need to go now, you know? So every, again, every situation is different, but it's just really just being aware, having conversations, having relationships, you know, like we deal with the DJs, like what's working in your club, what's going on, you know, talking to the radio stations, what have they seen work for other artists, you know, stuff like that. Um, and just reacting, you know, um, I wouldn't say that there's one way to kind of manage the crisis other than just with a sense of urgency. I mean, really like, just, I mean, cause I'm so still kind of in it. It's just like this whole campaign with Wale, like just seeing where he was 12 months ago to seeing where he is now. Like, I mean, you just never give up. And when you got dope music, dope music is gonna speak for itself. Like we said, we can study all the analytics, we can graphs and, you know, comparable artists and people like, oh, kids don't listen to lyrics anymore. Or, Nobody likes real rap or like whatever. Like dope music is always gonna stand up. And I'm just a firm believer in that. Like there's a lot of people to believe, oh, put the right feature on the record, you know, but I'm like, ah, it hits a hit. Like, I don't care who's on the record. Like, if it's a hit, it's a hit, you know? So that's, I would say that's the lesson that I keep learning over and over again. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would say find somebody that can help you speak on your music for you. Um, and also learn how to detach from your music and look at it like a product because if you want to do this for a living in a business it's a product you know what I mean and even though it's your heart and it's your soul and it's your kid like I said you're putting it up for sale you know what I mean you're like depending on the opinions of others to uh <laughs> um so I mean again I would say learn to detach but if you can't you know, get somebody that is detached that can speak for you. You know, like, it, again, it doesn't have to be a professional manager. It could be a friend or, or a colleague or maybe even somebody that's not a friend but somebody that you've just seen from a distance in class and they're just dope at their, what they do, their work ethic, they know how to pitch. Because at the end of the day, like, you got to be able to sell, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because in this day and age, um, a lot of times, it's easier to monetize uh, fame than it is to monetize talent, you know? So there's a lot of talent out there, but people, you know, our attention spans are really short with social media and we're like jumping to like the next hot thing, you know, or the next kind of like whatever, you know? So it's like, it, you know, sometimes it's tough because sometimes you do believe in the music and you just know that there's something there, but the image isn't there, you know? and. I don't want to put anybody on blast, but there's a few artists that I work with that I really believe in that are super dope, but I just feel like people just don't see them, you know what I mean? Because they don't have the, the like, the just the image, like you said. Like So it is tough. It's tough because it is a business, and 
and people's attention spans sometimes aren't long enough to sit there through 30 to 60 minutes of just audio. They need to be looking at something. If there's not something compelling to look at, then they tune out, you know what I mean? So that, that's a challenge, you know? Finding out what is special and unique about them that other people are gonna connect with, you know, and finding a way to highlight those things and, and broadcast those things, whatever they may be. You know, each, each artist is gonna be different. It's gonna be very specific to the project. Like I, tell, I told Courtney the other day, like there's no one size fits all promotion plan. Like when you're promoting, you have to tailor it to the individual because um, especially now, like with social media and stuff, people want the real, you know what I mean? They don't want something that feels sold. They don't want something that feels like a sales pitch. They want something that feels authentic and real. So you have to find a way to kind of highlight those things that are real and broadcast them in a way that people are gonna care, which is tough. I mean, it's easier said than done, but you know, you gotta find a way to bring awareness. Yeah, I mean, I think that we are for the artists. I think that that's why we all got into the business is because we love the art. But at the end of the day, when you're doing a deal with a corporation, you have to really cover yourself. Like you have to have the right attorneys and you have to have the right team to really analyze what you are agreeing to, you know? And that's just with anybody. That's not just with a label. That's if you were doing an ad campaign for Coca-Cola, like they're gonna try to maximize and get everything they can out of you because they're a for-profit organization, you know? So I feel like the, you know, labels, I think are a little more, artistic than maybe some of these like you know brands that are just pushing a soda or whatever but I feel like you still have to cover yourself you have to do your own due diligence you know what I mean to make sure that what you're agreeing to and if you don't believe that it's advantageous to you you don't have to sign you can you know right now to me is the best time to be independent because you can go direct to consumer like when I was growing up there was no Spotify like if you if you wanted to make a dope record that was the quality to play on the radio you had to have a lot of money to get into an expensive studio you couldn't do it in your bedroom like when I worked you're a jerk for the new boys the same record that we played on the radio stations all across the country was the one that they made in their mom's apartment you know what I'm saying with a mattress leaned up against the wall to make a booth you know what I mean so it's like I feel like you guys have the opportunity of technology and Instagram. You can market yourself. You don't need television. You don't need radio. Like you can go directly to your audience in a way that artists 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago could never do. They had to have a big time investor. And the only way they could do that is go to a major record company, you know? So I feel like this is really the time for artists to, to thrive. You know, you have all the tools right there. No, I, I think, I mean, there definitely are priorities based on, you know, what your goals and objectives are at that time and, you know, what product is delivered and what is ready to go and what needs more work. And, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into it outside of just money. Um, you know, some one artist might have a project that is great, you know, that they're working on, but they're not really ready to be mass marketed yet. So maybe you don't put the same don't push them in the same areas. Maybe you don't push that to radio yet until it's ready, until it has a fan base. Because once you play it on the radio, if it does, if people don't aren't familiar with it fast, they won't research. If it doesn't research, it comes off the radio. So sometimes you want a certain level of familiarity for the artist or the song before you go to radio. So that might change the level of prioritization. And we have, you know, we have conversations inside the label about what our goals and objectives and what things we're working on. And just like any other company, you know, it's like, okay, we're gonna push Coke Zero right now, and then we're gonna push this. And it's a little different, obviously, because artists are people, but at the end of the day, like, like I said, like you're putting your art out there to be mass marketed. So you have to consider that. And if you don't wanna be mass marketed, then you stay indie, you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that, I mean, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, all of them, like, it doesn't, it's not always going to appeal to everybody. I feel like every sound has its niche base, and then some of them can cross over into bigger bases. Um, you know, what I had to learn coming into the business is to have my professional ear and my personal ear. So just because I don't listen to it in my personal time doesn't mean I can't understand that maybe you listen to it and you like it and figure out how to present it to you in a way that you support it. You see what I'm saying? So... I feel like it's not really about my personal preference of what I like. It's just about, do I see a market for this? Do I see a place where this fits where other people will get excited about it, you know? 
Yeah, we, we yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, we have fan engagement departments that work on that all day tirelessly, you know, working with the algorithms and working on, you know, making sure that the engagement is high, the engagement rate for artists, because at the end of the day, it's not how many followers you have, it's how many people actually engage with your post, and that's what moves you up in the algorithm. So it's not only about the money you spend. Um, you know, there are creative ways you can do things with advertising, like I know on my Instagram, I've seen this Kanye West album pop up one million times. Like every day, it's like in my story, it's like on my feed. I'm like, how did they do that? Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm getting these Def Jam posts all day. But um, I don't think it's only about money. I think it's also, you know, about the engagement and the, the passion of your fan base and things like that. But we do have a department called Fan Engagement. I'm not a part of that, so I can't really speak educated on it, but it works on that and, you know, optimizing those tools to make sure that we do get the maximum reach for our artists. Awesome. I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.